be in Paris, be night keeper in subway station, 3 a.m., listening to radio, checking cameras and motion sensors. Motion sensor turns on, middle of a tunnel, no other entrance than the two stations. No one is supposed to be there, no camera there, no other motion sensor either. Get call from other station who noticed it as well. Send groups from both stations to check it. Tunnel is a straight line. Can see the other station 300 meters in the distance. Well lit. No place to hide. No exit. Guys call me. Say they see two people. One of them is screaming and running towards them. See the guy on the camera meet with the two agents on the edge of the platform. Looks panicked. Check motion sensor. It regularly blinks. They discuss for a minute. They tell me he's a tagger went in through the other station, told them he has been attacked by a ghost. They tell me that they can see the ghost in the tunnel. Ask guys from the other station. They see him too. Motion sensor is still blinking. Welp, sure as a ghost. Guys from both stations enter the tunnel to catch the other guy. He's reported to run to the side of the tunnel in between lights. Motion sensor stops blinking. Watch camera. No one exiting the tunnel throughout the whole thing. No news for two minutes. Slight nope. Call other station. No one seen exiting the tunnel on their end. Motion sensor starts blinking again. They've met halfway through the tunnel where the motion sensor is. Flooded the whole area with powerful flashlights. No one was found. Nope. They bring the tagger back. Call the cops. Meanwhile, talk to him. Says... A shadow pursued him while screaming at him. He says he actually never screamed. Nope. Here, an electronic relay clicking. Turn around. Motion sensor is blinking. 20 plus people along with cops go to the tunnel. No one is found. That motion sensor was since considered to be malfunctioning. It lit again at night occasionally, but none of those that were there this night want to check it. How some guy managed to disappear in a tunnel without any exit remains an enigma. I later participated in scouting the entire tunnel, searching for some hidden path. The subway interconnects with the sewers and caves of nearby buildings, and even the catacombs. It can happen in Paris that some people open new ways between different underground networks by simply destroying a wall between the two. We checked on maps to see if there was some nearby cave went through the entire tunnel checking every square centimeter for a hole, digging the railway ballast in case it was below, but nothing was found. And the guys that were there in the tunnel that night were certain there was someone. It's a perfectly straight tunnel between the two stations, so it gives a pretty clear view. Sadly, there isn't the slightest proof of anything. Cameras are too angled towards the platforms to see the tunnel. I had kept the recordings just in case, but... I never spotted anything on them, and there was no follow-up. Nothing else happened since. I think I saw Goatman today. Some background information. I live right by a bike trail. It cuts into a dense forest that goes on and on for miles. The trail is actually laid upon old railroad tracks, and along the way, there are still old pre-1900 buildings lost in a dense forest. That's still remains unexplored. When I was a kid, I always was deathly afraid to go out onto these woods for some reason. Well, what I encountered today has rekindled that fear. This afternoon at about 1 p.m., I really felt like riding my bike. The weather is so nice now, and I love being alone out in the woods, away from everyone else. So, it was perfect. I pack up a notebook, a pen, always on hand in case of inspiration and a big bottle of water, and I head off into the woods. The opening is so tiny against the vast, dense forest, you have to know exactly where it is to find it. It always seems spooky and mystical because it's just this black, almost doorway-looking void amidst this mountain of trees and underbrush. I speed down the hill as usual, and in a couple of seconds, I reach the crossroads. One goes forward into the thickest parts of the forest. The left goes towards the city and highway, and the right goes out into the open endless fields and farmland with the big patches of forest spread throughout. I sat there for a little bit. I took a swig of water. 
and I head right. I haven't been out very far past the fields before, and I have a day to kill, so I keep going and going and going. Past the familiar broken down railroad checkpoint, or whatever it is. Past the one single house that lays just outside the trail. Past the huge rusting metal bridge. So I'm going and going and going, and eventually, I see a beware sign nailed to a tree, then another, then a couple altogether nailed to an old busted phone line, and finally, a huge wooden barricade that says, stay out. Pick related, except imagine thicker and the trail like 20 feet higher than the tree bases. The thing was already pushed partially out of the way like someone had been in before me, and being the rebel that I am, I just had to see what was back there something I soon came to regret. So I am riding again and the forest is far thicker than before, and on each side of the trail, about four inches out, it drops right off, steep as fuck and deadly, that's for sure. At this point, I'm a bit uneasy as it is completely silent, not a fucking sound, I mean, this is deep thick forest, why am I not hearing any animals? Immediately after this realization, I come upon an opening finally. Down below, it's now swampy and dark. The trees are far and few between and rise out of these deep, dark pools of water. I'm creeped out at this point. It's eerie as fuck out here. I'm totally alone and I'm getting tired. I start crossing this very sketchy old wooden bridge slowly and then I hear this deep, low grumble and I immediately pause. Nothing but eerie, empty silence. Not a fucking sound all around me. I then carefully start again and realize it's just my tire. The fucking thing has gone flat. I have no idea how I didn't realize this earlier at any point in my trip. I mean, it was totally and utterly dead. Then I hear this dreadful fucking blood curdling scream tear through silence. I'm fucking teary eyed and have goosebumps as I tell this. I'm frozen. I have no idea what it was, no idea where it was. And of all fucking times, my tire is fucking flat as a nine-year-old Chinese boy. A stick breaks, and I immediately whip my bike around and started pedaling my fucking ass off. All of a sudden, I start hearing shit crashing in the woods, and I don't dare fucking look out there. I am swerving all over the shitty trail because it's covered in pebbles, holes, cracks, broken branches, and all kinds of other shit that can all totally kill me at this speed. And somehow, before, I didn't see these clumps of white stringy fur all caught on the trees and along the trail. The sounds of something racing through this dense thick brush are so loud, I can hear it over my horrendously obnoxious flat tire, squishing and squashing on the ground as I am almost spinning the chain off the gear. At this point, a million things are racing through my mind. My legs are absolutely burning from riding so far out into the woods, and now, blazing back on this goddamn tire. Fuck. I swerved right on the edge of the trail, and the sandy, pebbly shit went flying out into the trees, jumped over a huge pothole, and heard another loud-ass scream. That didn't even faze me at this point. I am just pounding my legs, breathing so hard, my chest hurts, and waiting for my tire to explode at any moment, and to finally get eaten by whatever the fuck is chasing me. I just missed the barricade, literally centimeters from crashing head first into the thing. Finally, I see a light off into the distance. I'm close to getting back on the fields and back towards home. I'm filled with a new wind of energy and kick it into hyperdrive now. The sounds of crashing are now getting softer and slower. And then stop. I fucking made it. I finally made it. I zoom right out into the sunlight. I've never been happier in my fucking life to feel the sun in my eyes. At that moment, I just stop. The fatigue just immediately hits me like a wave. I'm dead fucking tired and couldn't move another inch. I turned my head around to look back at whatever the fuck was there, and in the darkness, I see two red burning eyes just staring right at me. I felt my entire body go cold. Then, in a flash they were gone. I rode back fast as I could, but eventually I slowed down and crawled my way all the way back. 
I downed what little bit of water I had left, and even though it was hot, I wasn't sweating one drop. I was literally frozen from that stare. Did I see a fucking Goatman X? Tomorrow I'm getting a gun license and buying a shotgun, and never going out into those woods again. Fuck. I'm even considering moving into a city away from any wooded areas now. Could you describe it? Did you get a good look? It was tall. Taller than me, at least, and I'm six foot two. It was slim and had long limbs, and I could see it was pale under the scattered light that broke through the canopy. Part 1 Now let me start by saying that, having spent my entire life living in New Mexico, a lot of people I know have claimed to have seen a skinwalker. They are kind of our regional boogeyman, but ask a Navajo about them, and they will either absolutely ignore the question, and all following, or they will kind of laugh it off saying something to the effect of, well, white people believe their myths. Well, here's my story regarding them. My father owns a small delivery service that operates out of Farmington, New Mexico. We mostly deliver small packages out to the middle of nowhere that are too much of a hassle for the larger delivery companies to bother with. My dad is the only employee, and we have a few pickup trucks and a trailer. One day, we get a delivery out to Window Rock, Arizona, on the Navajo Reservation about two hours from Farmington. My dad gets the call for the job while he is chilling with his Navajo friend, Travis, and his girlfriend. Travis mentions how he's got a family in Window Rock that he hasn't seen in ages, and suggests that they go with him. I was about six or seven at the time, and it was a summertime, so Dad decides we'll go down together. He can do his delivery really quick, and then, while Travis sees his family, we can go check out the window rock. It's a big rock face with a large hole in it that goes to the other side. It's pretty cool. We had to convoy in separate trucks since my dad's was loaded down with freight. We decided to bring along some talkies so we could communicate with one another. We spend our time in window rock. Everything is generally uneventful and we start heading home along the old highway with my dad and I in front, and Travis and his girlfriend in their truck behind us. I honestly don't remember most of the Window Rock trip, but this next part, I can never forget. We're somewhere on the highway between Window Rock and Gallup, New Mexico. It had just rained earlier in the day, and the road was kind of slick, so we were taking it pretty slow. Part 2 On the left of the highway, there was nothing but sandstone cliffs, and on the right, there's a huge field separated from the road by a small barbed wire fence. We crest the top of this hill, and down at the bottom of the hill, we see what appears to be a very large dog, sitting back on its hunches in the middle of the road, facing the cliffs. My dad calls over the radio. Hey Trav, do you see that big ass dog? Travis starts yelling back over the radio. That is not a dog. Speed up right now and hit it. He sounds almost hysterical. He just keeps screaming. Hit it! JJ, you have to hit it! Please! Please hit that fucking thing right now! So, my dad starts to speed up and as we get a bit closer, I can begin to see a little bit more clearly. It's covered in this brown, wiry, matted hair that appears to have dried blood all over it. It's still facing the cliffs, but the moment our headlights hit it, it turns and looks at us, and it has a face. I don't know how else to describe it other than a mix between a bear's and a human's face. It looks twisted and distorted and almost in pain. As we get closer to this thing, we start to realize it's actually fucking huge. Though it was still sitting on its hunches, it is about shoulder height with the hood of the truck. We get literally inches from hitting it when it lets out this scream that sounds like someone screaming as their lungs were filling with water and it leaps backwards towards the field, landing just on our side of the barbed wire fence. Then, with another leap, it was gone from sight. Travis comes over the radio again. Holy shit, keep driving. We have to get out of here. We have to go faster. He kept repeating that last part. We have to get out of here, and we have to go faster. Part 3 Pretty soon, we are speeding like crazy, and just as we start to come near the outskirts of Gallup, we get pulled over. Travis pulls his truck over with us. Naturally, this makes the cop, a Navajo man himself, very on edge and he immediately asks why Travis felt the need to pull over as well. 
Travis just says, We just saw Skinwalker a few miles back, and it's been following us. The officer immediately turns white, stammers something about a verbal warning, gets in his car, and takes off. We do the same. We didn't see anything else that night, but when we got home, Travis refused to let us leave without taking some kind of Navajo totem thing that was supposed to keep it away. So, yeah, I guess that's my Skinwalker story. Sorry for the length, but thank you for reading. Be me, 18 right after high school. Decide to take a cross-country trip before I start university. Good times. Mostly camp. Need work every now and then. End up broke in New Mexico looking for work. Find work replacing roofs on Navajo Reservation. Government project. The rest of the crew stays in a school overnight. I decide to camp out in the desert. First night. Wake up to sounds of someone walking around my tent. Freaks me right the fuck out. Wake in the morning and find a pot that I used to cook with. Missing. Find a yellow flower in its place. Next night. Footsteps again. Another flower, but nothing's missing. Third night. Footsteps, and I decide to investigate. Get out of the tent, and I hear the footsteps scurry off. This is getting fucking weird. Start yelling into the desert. What do you want? Next night, I decide to sleep in my truck so I can look at my campsite during the night. Stay up all night. Around 3 a.m., I see her. A native girl about my age. She looks around my site and puts a flower on my cooking table. Get out of the truck. She runs off. Next night. She shows up again, but I left a flower for her. She picks it up and sits down by my campfire. I come out from the shadows and she starts to get up, but I calm her. I sit across from her. We were miles away from anything deep in the desert. I start asking questions. Are you out here alone? What are you doing out here? No answer. She stands up and gives me the follow me hand gesture. I do. I follow her. We walk for about a mile. I was camped out at the bottom of a mesa. The breeze blowing down it at night was comfy. We found our way through the quarters of mesas and down into a canyon. In the canyon, there was water and vegetation and shit. She knelt down beside the stream and picked a flower and handed it to me. She said in broken English, Hold this. It will keep you safe. Then she kissed me. Safe from fucking what? She let go of my hand and walked towards the canyon wall. And then, she was gone. Fucking gone. One second there, the next second not. I had an urge to follow where she went to see what happened to her. But another urge that told me not to, and to just turn around. I got lost out there that night. I tried to go back the way we came, but nothing looked familiar. I walked all night and half of the next day. Just before dusk, I ran into four Navajo men who were looking for me. They told me I hadn't shown up for work that day, and everyone on my crew just thought I had moved on. Until one of the people at the house that we were working on overheard him saying that I had told him about my nightly visitor and the flowers. The Navajo whose house we were working on was an elder and ordered a search party immediately. They told me she was a descendant of the people who lived there before them, that they had left this world thousands of years ago and moved into another, that very rarely a portal opens up where people can cross over. Legend goes that they send young pretty girls to lure men into crossing over to be used as slaves. Their telltale is a flower. If I would have followed her, I would have crossed over, and who knows when or if the portal would have opened up, or if I would have even been able to find it. They said that if I didn't go on my own, the girl would have slipped me drugs and a kiss to make me confused and lost. And that night, if they hadn't had found me, the other side was going to take me by force. They called her a poison woman. So there I was, showering at something like 3 a.m. Showers are terrifying for me to begin with, but having read creepypasta all night, I am particularly creeped out. It's time to wash my hair, furiously shampoo, then run head underwater as quick as fucking possible. Done. No skeletons. Alright. Smooth sailing. Realize I'm just paranoid. 
Time to wash face. Suds all up in demise. No worries. Distinct sound of bathroom door opening. Oh my god. Freeze dead still. Suds still in eyes. Summon all the goddamn courage of Clint Eastwood, Bruce Willis, and fucking Charleston Heston combined. Say in my most authoritative and badass voice possible. Who's there? A dead silence resonates with my despair. As I realize, this is not my roommate coming in for a quick piss. The only sounds are the highly underpowered showerhead that I use. And my heartbeat. Nobody is as quiet. I am literally more scared than I have ever been in my life. I open my eyes to the burning sensation of chemicals and shift my gaze towards the bathroom door. Through the frosted glass of my shower doors, I see a doorway of pitch black illuminated by the incandescence of my bathroom lights. Fight or flight kicks in. I am in a fucking shower. There is no option to run. Charlie, Bruce, and Clint are watching me from hero heaven. I shit you not, I fucking whispered to myself, so it ends like this. Time stops. Countless wings of doves flutter. Somewhere in New York, a comedian dies, and I decide to go down with a fight. In the bat of a hummingbird's wing, I splash my face through the shower to get as much soap out as possible, slam open the shit forsaken shower doors, and fly out of it, fists fucking raised. The look of bewilderment, desperation, and nudity would have chilled even the slenderest of men to the bone. I was a man playing for keeps, and you never trust one with nothing to lose. My bathroom is by no means large, and could easily be considered very small. I take a running swing at darkness itself. In the heat of battle, I damn near trip over my cat. Um, cat? She sounds off. Prowl? Our unspoken understanding translates this as food. She rolls on her belly and starts purring at eye contact, swatting at non-existent moths. Nope, Dot, I should have closed the door properly. My cat will never know how close she came to making me straight up lose control of my bowels in the shower. I'm glad to know, though, that if I'm ever scared to death, I will fight the unknown horrors of the supernatural rather than cower like a bitch. Maybe... My cat was teaching me, like a Yoda that expects me to clean her shitbox.